48k hertz 48k 32 bit float the 32 bit float shouldn't matter that's like the that's like the um kind of like file density on my size essentially but mm -hmm. if i'm at 48k and you're at like 30 something over if we record over a decent amount of time it can become offset and it's really annoying and awkward to fix so uh if you want if you need me to change mine to match yours i'll do it if you want to change yours to match mine also good okay. easy easy I'll have to look that up later. I have no answer. Let's just roll with it. It'll All be right. a Sounds like a plan. opportunity if it hurts. Yay! <laughs> Magic! Yeah. So this is the Journey of the Forever GM podcast, and today I've got Practical Rook, or I'm calling him Rook because that's too much of a mouthful. <laughs> and he is, I could say widely known, you're pretty widely known for your Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash practical rook. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I'm decent. I've got a decent, I've got a, I've got a really good community. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, the community's awesome. I think it was 83 followers on, or no, 863. Oh man, I read the wrong number. 10%. Yeah. Tax man. You jumped up 800 in 10 minutes. Boss. Uh. <laughs> Anyways, this yes. is a podcast about D&D &D life, journey, and distractions that we eventually get on, I'm sure. Tangents. But we were doing small talk before this, and we're just going to go back to it. Um, Rook, where were we in our small talk? We were talking about getting beat up for playing D&D. &D. Oh, yeah, being being the D&D &D nerds. Oh, yeah, I was saying that in my... Throughout my high school career, which is a while ago now, you whippersnappers, D&D um, &D and like, role-playing games had moved on from the being bullied for doing them or from them like, oh, I hate this guy, he's just a nerd, da 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 um, I, you know, My high school had a, an RPG club that I was, of course, a part of. Oh, cool. That was actually the first time I ever played a Heroes. Oh. The Heroes system or playing a hero in D&D? &D? Uh, uh, the Heroes system. Okay, cool. Was that the one with the uh, uh, hundred sided dice, like percentiles? Uh, I have not or, observed it used. Um, it's the one we play well, with Bro. It's either the one that I think is D twenty or D sixes. It's D sixes. It's the it's okay. the um the one I'm playing with Bro, where I'm playing my character. I based on a glitter boy from Riffs. <laughs> <laughs> nice, yeah. Because I played a different one that was hundred sided dice. But That's fantastic. In the small talk, I cut my story short because we wanted to record it. <clears throat> now they got, I got crap in my throat. The <laughs> In my time in high school, it was like slightly bullied to play D&D. &D. And so I was that one kid who was trying to get in fights with jocks. And the, they would literally do that whole macho bullshit of, What, you want to fight about it? And I'm like, yes. Fight me. <laughs> I Fight do. me, I do. please. First one's free, bitch. <laughs> oh my god. Like, I, was, I was literally itching for a fight. Like, I wanted a fight. I grew up scrapping with my siblings. That's probably why. They I was going to say, are you, are, you like, are you like 6'6", 250 pounds of muscle in high school? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just that scrawny nerd. Although, I grew up um, renovating and doing house uh, fixing, so... I was built for doing construction my whole life. I'm, oh, I'm oh, you got built. that muscle density. I'm like, you I'm like farmer built. Yeah, I look That's thin rude. and scrawny, but I'm accidentally strong. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you earned it. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just helping. I was just a child doing what I could to help out. Oh, kawaii desu yo. <laughs> Not as cinnamon roll as Shane, so can't earn that title. <laughs> I, I have seen very few of you, like IRL. I know what bro looks like, and I think that's actually it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Shane's personality is cinnamon roll. That's what I'm saying. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, is he rotund He's not but a sweet? Is he round but... I, like, I, I didn't... <laughs> Which facets? <laughs> I guess it's a newer term. But either way, yeah, I was itching for a fight, and eventually, like, I just got to the point where I was sick of it. I grew up, like, super shy. I'm taking over Ooh, your episode, yep. I apologize. But I grew up super shy. <laughs> it's your show, bro. Do whatever you want. Yeah. 
But no, I dig it. I dig it. And that honestly kind of feeds into a, a reason why a lot of people play D and D. Well, I got sick of it in high school. I got to the point where I was fed up with my own bullshit, and I was like, "Fuck it! I'm learning charisma. I'm doing stuff. I'm just gonna try things." And I was an awkward duck. I made very few friends. Mm -hmm, I fit mm -hmm. in really well with the outcasts. Because, oh my god, I am... <sighs> I was the awkward embodiment of punk without the band. Ah! Uh, okay, now, I have one question, and I need you to be yeah. honest. Did you have a black trench coat? Oh, I wished. I didn't have the money <laughs> to buy trip pants. <laughs> I wished I had trip pants. I still, to this day, although I don't think I'd wear them, but it's I mean, symbolism. I mean, nowadays, it's... <laughs> What's the symbology here? <laughs> symbolism. The word is symbolism. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody gets the reference. Uh, anyway. It's Willem Dafoe in one of the best movies ever. Too bad they never made a sequel. No, I'm... Yeah, yeah, too bad they never made a sequel. I haven't seen the second one, but I know it's not going to be as good as the first one. Uh, Boondock Saints, for anyone who doesn't know, please watch it. It's a great movie. Yeah, it's real good. But, um, but yeah, like, I got to the point where I just got sick of being weird and trained myself in charisma, and I studied, and I learned, and I've always been kind of bookish and studyish. Intelligence and resourcefulness are, like, my... Croxes. That's why I'm a bard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I eventually just said, fuck it. And I would look at weird people or people I met who didn't seem like pricks. And I'd say, do you play D&D? &D? And that would be my opener to meet them. Hell yeah, there you go, man. <laughs> and it's like, I met so many D&D &D players and so many groups, no matter where I moved to, just by just saying, hey, do you play D&D? To anyone who looked like they might be intellectual or nerdy. There you go. And that's how I met all my groups. <laughs> Ooh, when fucking but, uh, manifesting your own destiny. Yeah. Yep. The bard brings the group together. <laughs> I make the plans. And when those plans fail, I make more plans. A <laughs> D&D movie, which uh, I hope we get a sequel, but it's not looking likely. Oh, they actually did really well with that. We are getting, like, very far from what I expected, but I'm happy with this. This is a good conversation. Oh, yeah, I, I'm sure. I loved all the itty-bitty tiny plugs in there that they did. Like, they did a super good job. Oh. I'd say I loved the movie. I The movie was great. Yeah. I just, uh, no, I was saying I don't think... The soundtrack is great. Oh, soundtrack is great. I was saying I don't think we're going to get a sequel because I don't think it did incredibly well at the box office. Hmm. And... That is unfortunately what you have to uh, you have to do to get more movies made. Is they have to make money. Yeah, I think they were positive, but either way, it was a great marketing campaign for D and D. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, ho ho hoping people watched it who had never played before and gone, "Hey, that looks like fun." Yeah, that's kind of what. So the D and D movie and Baldur's Gate are mm. amazing gateway drugs. To D and D, yes. Like I am all for them in that sense, but I feel like <laughs> Baldur's Gate is going to create a lot of high expectations for new players. I Whereas can see the that. D and D movie feels a lot like How to Train Your Dragon, where it's like, okay, now I want to go do stuff. I'm inspired. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's. I, I think it's also touching. Bards are not that strong. <laughs> no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> no, no, no. Like Baldur's Gate has the upside of the game runs itself perfectly. You know, absent, yep. absent, like um, you know, software issues and shit. But the, ga <laughs> and the game and glitches. <laughs> but as far as like, I'm gonna attack. You rolled twenty. Here's all your bonuses. Here's all your thing. Here's all your. It applies all your stuff. It applies all your negatives. It it, it, mm -hmm. it does all that. It has their you know weaknesses. All the all the crunchy numbers that usually it's incumbent on players to remember, and the game does it all perfectly. So going from Baldur's Gate to tabletop could be a little overwhelming and a little like, oh my god, like what do I need to do? What can I do? What what are my spells? What do I have? When in the game form, they're right in front of the player. 
But yeah, on the on the other hand, D and D tabletop can be so much more freeform, so much more. What do you want to do? You know, Baldur's Gate. It is necessarily restricted by the system, so it's like, oh, I want to. I want to climb that rock and do a moonsault on the bad guy's head. <laughs> Fucking try. Go for it. Sure. A DM, a good, you know, I think a good DM would interpret that request if it's, if it's made in good faith as a player wanted to have fun and saying, yeah, fucking go for it. See what happens. Where, of course, you can't do that in Baldur's Gate you can't, because they, they can't program an infinite number of situations that any player at any point might want to try. Yeah. Yeah. So it, I also appreciated that they didn't incentivize evil actions very much. I, I didn't do many evil things in, in my short playthrough of Baldur's Gate. Um, I kind of read the Sparks notes on the evil stuff because, like, I was just curious. Um, I'm not going to play the game 30 times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the evil choices are very short and there's not a lot of um, dialogue. There's not a lot of backstory to them. If you choose to get the drow on your team by killing off, like, a village, then you actually alienate three of the characters and they leave your party. Interesting. So wow, okay. You lose most of your characters because they refuse to be with someone so evil. Wow. Oh, they, they de-incentivize it significantly, yeah. it sounds like. All right. Yeah, because you lose Karlak, which everyone loves. Um, I think Gale stays... Asterion, I'm sure, stays because he's a dick. Everyone loves him. He's a great character. I love the voice actor. He's great. Yeah, I've heard great things about him and like the voice actor oh. being on Twitter and stuff. Oh, yeah. He keeps messing with people. It's really fun. He did a really good job. Hold on one sec. I got to move my cat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for your patience as I move my cat. I, I actually appreciate um, my fiance. I'm going to say girlfriend because I'm lazy. Um, she played i want to say like 500 hours of baldur's gate 3 like she doesn't play very many video games ever and then she got that and just killed it several playthroughs like she knows how to do everything like it's crazy she now uses terminology like i failed my perception check or like she'll just drop D, &D references and jokes and whatnot and so Understanding the baseline concept of how to roll skills and sometimes you have bonuses, I think is a really big boon to people starting D&D for the first time. Yeah, definitely. I, I completely agree. It's learning the system, learning how the system works. And so you're not trying to learn a system and role play a character at the same time. Yeah. Or be the GM who is the computer stand in <laughs> and have like 30 things going at the same time. <laughs> spinning plates, juggling. It's, uh, oh yeah. I always say the forever GM is another term for masochist. <laughs> hey, some people are into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I'm in Wisconsin. Eventually, I hope I can get a hold of Gygax, Ernie Gygax. Because mm -hmm. all the original D&D &D crew are actually in Lake Geneva, like an hour or two south of me. No way. Yeah, like, the Ernie Gygax actually is Tensor from Tensor's Floating Disc. No shit. Gygax's son is Tensor, as well as, like, all these guys in Lake Geneva mostly. Some moved out to Cali. Good luck. Some in Minnesota. <laughs> but all those original crews are the names you know, like Melf's Acid Arrow. Uh, I think Melf was actually an NPC by Gygax himself. But let's see here. What about Morton Kaiden's faithful watchdog? Morton Kaiden, I have the notes here. I was researching <laughs> people I want to hang with. Is Rob Kuntz? Um, actually, Rob Kuntz was running the KUNTZ. Kuntz, I thought so. I'm going to go with that because it sounds better. I was going to say, you won't get TOS'd randomly. <laughs> yeah. But Rob, I'm going to go with that, <laughs> okay. was running the game that Gygax was in, Gary Gygax. And Gary Gygax was actually playing Morden Kaiden. So Gygax is Morden Kaiden. That's so awesome. That's so yeah, damn cool. And, <laughs> and his buddy Rob, who was running the game for him, when he was running the game for Rob, he, Rob was Bigby. With the crushing hand! <laughs> yeah. 
And it's so freaking cool. And it's like all these guys are just right here in my backyard. And it's like, oh man, I want to get their stories. Like, um, Ernie Gygax had a, uh, I think he had an apprentice to his character. And that was Otto. Otto's Irresistible Dance. Oh, that one's hilarious. And it's like all these guys, like Liamund's um, Secure Shelter. Liamund was played mm. by Leonard Lakofka, I think. It's a very unique name. But yeah. either way, all these guys. Oh, I would love to talk to all of them. I'm going to hit them up either way. I was saying, <laughs> what's the worst I can say? I'd be like, no, nah, we don't want to hang out. I'd be like, all right, cool. At least you shot. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to hit them up. I'm also going to hit up the third eyed guys. Um, Skip Williams, Jonathan Tweet, um, uh, Monty Cook. Like the big names. Oh, yeah. Because I've been seeing their names forever. But that aside, I don't know which of those will actually become episodes. We'll find out in the long run. Yeah. But <laughs> back to you, Mr. Rook. You're That's in me. Cali. I'm in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. So... You're not just a streamer or a D&D player. You have other stuff in your free time. Yeah. What did young Rook live through that led you to be the mustachioed crowd maestro before me? <laughs> uh, I was I was also a band kid. I was like, <laughs> nice. band kid nice. for a while. And then in high school, I was like, I want to try theater too. Cause Wait, I like, what instrument? Real quick. Barry Sachs. Oh, nice, nice. That's, so you were a theater kid too? Mm-hmm. Yeah, started in band, played Barry in marching band, and I was like, I want to I wanna try theater. I want to, because I like acting. I like hamming it up. One of my earliest, earliest, earliest influences um, is Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Mm, we, yeah. were, we were those guys just quoting the movie, <laughs> uh, and it was awesome. <laughs> and I was like, I, I just liked, I like doing this, and uh, I started doing a little, like, improv. I joined, like, the theater improv club, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> but then, like, I started doing stage shows, and I don't, I'm not a huge fan of memorizing a ton of lines. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the memorization itself is super rough for me, and I, and I, don't, I don't enjoy it. It's part of the process. I don't, I don't really enjoy it. So I, I was like that, well, you know, I like acting. I like performing, but I don't like you know, having to cram the script. Remember your entrance. Remember your exits. And remember yeah, this and that. So that yeah. was kind of what led me into voice acting. And I was like, I get to act, I get to still perform, but I have a script in front of me. It was a weird <laughs> win. The perfect option for an actor with ADD. Oh, it's, a, it's ADHD <laughs> now. ADD is no longer in the DSM. Really? Yeah, because is now it, ADHD is, is two thing? subtypes. Oh. It, essentially, but the ADHD has the two subtypes of inattentive and hyperactive, and that's how it's medically delineated at this point i don't know the difference i'm gonna offend people i'm sure but isn't it going to kill your attention if you're hyperactive it 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 can the more like the hyperactivity is the from my understanding the like incessant need for dopamine need for dopamine need for dopamine so you're always like moving and fiddling and twitching like i always do and it drives my other uh buddies on my podcast insane because i'm like <laughs> Now, I've been real quick on my mute button lately of just like if I have to fiddle or twitch or something, it's mute and click, 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 you get to act, you get to improv, you get to be a character, and that and there's not even a, a script to read. You just get to say whatever you want. Yeah, you just get to live it, and that's and that's a lot of fun. Improv uh, has been a big part of my acting history as well. I'm in a I'm in an improv comedy podcast called Wasting All the Time that I've been running for a, not running, but I've been in for the last decade or so. Let's plug that because I always forget the exact link. For some reason, I don't have it bookmarked. <laughs> Uh, wastingallthetime.com <laughs> as a verse drift forward and somehow I forget it <laughs> yeah no I, I, I feel it I feel it um, that's a lot of fun I love doing that um, 
Like I said, in its improv, I've learned a lot about the technical skills behind improv and what makes it good and how to not shut down scenes and da da da, da you know, delving along with that. But again, it's, it's more acting. It's more being a character and doing voices and, and portraying different entities. So that's, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I like it. Yeah, it definitely seems to be something that would suit your personality really well. <laughs> Give or take that necessant. All right, this needed, this necessary. Jesus, my words today. Despite eh, who does words? the necessary mute button for your fidgeting. Yes, <laughs> and that's just another skill. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It beats sitting there with that one kid who wants to play with the dice at the table and roll them constantly. Oh yeah, that the the little the little noises. Um. Every, like mostly dice rolling, I'm cool with, but every so often if it's just the wrong clicky or if it's just the wrong frequency or just the wrong something, I'm like, I'm going to yeet you out a window. <laughs> oh, it just kills me when people are like stacking dice and the tower is eventually going to fall or they're rolling dice for no reason just to roll them over and over and over. That's, that's rough. That's and rough because like, then it's like you're not engaged yeah. in the game. Yeah. Yeah, that was in my earlier days. I haven't had somebody do that in a long time. Um, with the exception of a brand new player who'd never rolled dice before. Really? And I was like, just so you know, don't roll them too much. And he's like, oh, okay. And yeah, it's just... never been an issue since. Score, there you go. That's yeah. just, uh, this is common courtesy. Yep, but he was just playing with them because he'd never rolled dice. And it's like that and I that's... get. That's cool. You get you get to have fun with it. You get to hang out with it, play around with the dice. Like, that tactile sensation is is really neat. Yeah, yeah. I know one of my best friends here, he is an absolute dice roller. He wants to throw dice and as many as he can every single attack and just destroy stuff. <laughs> and it's like, can I just have the low power game where I'm like the random dude in the village who has a life? <laughs> well, yeah, and that's... <clears throat> goes into so many different types of D and D games that you can play, and it's important mm. that everyone is playing the same game. Oh, and if yeah. you're like, "Hey guys, this is going to be like a slice of life game where you're farmers, and like something happens to your village, and you got to this," and he's like, "I want to be a level twenty wizard with a sentient sword that can cut planets in half." Those two, <laughs> those two games do not run together well. <laughs> yeah, they do not. I have seen when they try to, and. Oh. It ends up with one person feeling useless, because they are, by comparison, mm. and the other person not understanding what the problem is. Yeah, and that's, yeah, there's nothing wrong with either type of those games. It's conflating them, where you, there are different goals in the, in the gameplay. It, yeah, it gets exactly. Real rough. That is very well said. Thanks. Okay, I gotta turn my background lights on, and I also gotta clear my throat, so give me a sec. You're good. Man, this is so much nicer with my stage lights on. <laughs> my overhead has probably one of three bulbs left, so... Oh, no. It's okay. It's I don't really use it for shit. If I ever want to be, like, super productive, I will just turn on my uh, streaming lights. Because my background is pine wood with yellow lights behind it. Uh -huh. So it's all very warm, and it gives me a warm glow. Nice. And then my... That Sounds like quite a life hack. Yeah, like I tried to study lighting. Lighting is its own thing. Oh my god. Let's jump into the, like... Yes, lighting is a degree program. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Let's talk about streamer stuff. Because, fuck it. <laughs> it's my show. <laughs> but so yeah, do, you know why, uh, do you know why cinematographers don't smoke? Because the smoke would go up and tar up the light films? Like the light lenses? Because it takes them five hours to light it. <laughs> it's a joke. It was a, sorry, oh, yeah, I set like that it. up as a very serious inquiry, but it's actually a joke. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I was like, just yes. in case I want to be smart. I appreciate <laughs> like... that. I appreciate that. <laughs> I always look to learn. That's why I'm uh, running a podcast about life and learning and stories and adventure. Be a sponge of knowledge. Yeah, that's the tricky thing. Is I'm going to say that a lot. I realize it's one of my coined catchphrases. But, um, I have a need to learn everything, and I don't understand it, I don't fight it, 
but I'd like to understand it, <laughs> especially because <laughs> I love to learn, so I don't understand it means I want to learn it. It is a <laughs> circular logic. <laughs> it's just like, hey, <laughs> need the knowledge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you do this thing. What do you do? You don't get to know. <laughs> but, yeah, lighting is a monster. Lighting's a monster. Yep, uh, I got I got lucky when I was in college. I took some film classes, and so I got like the basics of three point lighting, and then why you never do just straight three point lighting because it's boring, but it's really good for information for the viewer. And there's some back and forth on that, but yeah, going into streaming that is has really helped inform my decisions of like okay, where do I want to. Like, since also, since I just moved, I'm in a new house now, so it's like, okay, where do I put my desk relative to the window, and my ring light, and then how bright, and how do I need it to be, da, da, da. Like, because if it's, you just, if it's your face, it's just light on your face parts, so you gotta get it right. <laughs> yeah, so, I actually want to dig into that a little bit. Um, I'm yeah. a little iffy on three-point light. Is that with the hair light slightly behind you? front light which i think is supposed to be like 30 degrees off to the side and then a backlight to light up your set mm, close yeah i'm fine being wrong correct me so i could learn <laughs> traditional three-point lighting is you have your fill your excuse me your key light which is your main light source that's giving most that's bringing most of the photons and that's a little off-centered pointing at your subject okay like you don't want it straight on because then Weird things start to happen with shadows. Like, uh, <laughs> humans perceive shadows on faces uh, largely unconsciously, but very specifically. So if there's something weird with the shadows on a face, more often than not, people will just look at it and go, oh, that, that guy looks weird. Or let me just think, like, I'm, uncom I'm uncomfortable, I don't know why. So you kind of offset your, your fill, your, excuse me, your key light. Your key light is your main one. Okay. Then on the other so side... On that note, it would be really cool to intentionally, for one scene make it really awkward straight on uh, key light. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just to fuck and that's, with people. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's, it's been done. People do that in film all the time. That's exactly it. Because the, a, a key light straight on will generally not have a lot of shadows on the face, and the face will kind of look flat. Mm -hmm. And you won't see a lot of texturing on the pores and like anything else that's on the face because... For, for you to see texture, there has to be shadow. It has to come from an angle, come from the side, to cast that shadow, even the little tiny shadows, to see the texture. So if the light is straight on, then you don't get a lot of that. And it, again, it, can look, it looks a little weird, and you, people have used it, and it's actually a really cool thing to be like, oh my god, what's going on? But <laughs> you, have to, you have to pay attention to where your lights are. Because also consistency is a, another thing. And this is more film than streaming for sure, but consistency is a thing. If your lighting changes dramatically from shot to shot, again, most people are not cinephiles. Most people are just watching movies to watch movies. And so with dramatic lighting changes from shot to shot, it's going to go, what the fuck is going on? They're like, this looks really <laughs> weird. Where are they? What's happening? Um, and that can be disorienting, which again, if you want to do that, well, can go for it. Yeah, I love cinematography. That was... Uh, we're going to go back to lights, I swear, but... We, oh, I love studying films and like cinema and things like that and video games to inform my D and D stuff and also to inform my video game creation. Like Hell yeah. I haven't done video games in a while, but that was kind of what drove me in life early on. I'll talk about that story another time, but oh, I just love cinematography and like guiding a story. <laughs> There's so much behind the scenes. Oh my god. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's these shots can take hours to light for a shot that's on screen for five seconds, ten seconds. Like that's a more extreme example, but the, yeah. yeah, it can take a long time for him to go. Where is she? Cool, cut. We're good. <laughs> Let's move on. Next one. <laughs> okay, Jim, go fix the lights for three hours. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. So there are positions on set called stand-ins. And uh, our joke in class was it was always a girl with similar colored hair because <laughs> if they want the lights oh. to look a certain way on, like, Brad Pitt, they're not going to have Brad Pitt stand there for three hours while they go, bump it up. No? Okay, move it a little bit. Okay, bring it back. No, it's just not happening. And so you get a stand-in, yeah. who someone who stands in that spot and who looks roughly similar with, like, kind of similar colored hair. 
Uh, and they stand there while the lights are adjusted. And it sounds fucking awful. <laughs> yeah, that's a rough job, but damn, would that be needed? That is that is high profile necessary work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't take a degree, but um, key light, first light of three, of three yes. point lighting. Key light's your first. Second one is your fill. Your fill is going to be generally less bright than your key. It's going to be the opposite angle of your key. Mm -hmm. So your, if your key is like 30 degrees to your left, your fill is going to be somewhere around 30 degrees to your right. Sometimes more or less, depending on where the shadows are falling on the face. But your, your fill is generally less bright than your key, and it's used to fill in, to fill in, ah, hence the name fill, <laughs> yeah. the other side of the face that's not being lit by the key. And that creates interesting texture and interplay with shadow and light because it's not the same brightness. So you get this kind of, you don't get a sharp shadow down the middle with, with this particular setup, mm -hmm. but you get one side of the face is a little darker and illuminated a little differently, which creates interesting textures and interesting things to look at on the human face. Hmm. I always thought of it as the key light is like the sun, the very bright, illumination and then the mm -hmm. fill uh yeah the fill the second light is like the man-made bouncing of the sun around the room because there's always that secondary bounce of the walls reflecting light onto you and that's what it's simulating basically that is a way to look at it for sure i don't i that's i wouldn't say that's like the technical description but that's certainly an interesting way to approach how that kind of light would light a human face so yeah for sure yeah i'm a visual storytelling monkey so that's what i remember Love it, it by <laughs> <laughs> and then what's our third light the third light is the rim light that goes behind your subject and is the brightness can vary depending on like their hair color or clothing or hat or what they're wearing but that is shined at the subject kind of towards the camera and it illuminates basically the rim of their of their outline. It kind of outlines them in light, which separates them from the background. And that can be okay. really important because if if your subject has, you know, dark hair and the background is dark, that visually can get lost and it gets blurry and it gets messy and it, it gets more it gets difficult flat. to see. Yeah. It, yeah, it gets flat, especially with their face lit and then their hair is blending in the background or like their shoulders that can visually be get messy, and so the rim light is there to basically look like they have a little outline of light drawn around them to separate them from the background, and uh, you can play with that too. Like, there's a lot of, like, do you want a real subtle rim light to just kind of make them pop, or do you want to blast it and make them almost look like they're glowing? You can play with okay. it a lot. It's kind of like outlining them like a thumbnail, like with people outlining people with like blue outlines or whatever, but this would be just light to make it pop from the background. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. There's a, I can't, I can't remember who it was. There was a YouTuber I was watching a long time ago. He had um, this really nice purple rim light that was like huh. up and behind him. And it cast this. Re it was really subtle. It wasn't like like a. It wasn't like a neon Vegas light, but it was this real subtle purple that just highlight the kind of back of his head to separate him from the the wall and the, his background. And it was like it was really classy. So you can you can play a lot with with rim lights and how you interact, with, how your subject interacts with the environment. If you could find that, I'd love to take a look because that sounds like something very easy to understand if I saw it. Yes, I will see if I can find it. But in the not, meantime, not like right now. It was, I'm going to sit here and yeah. make you wait for me to Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like looking up rules mid-game. Don't Cook do that. Booking. Don't pull out the book. Cookbooking. But um, one thing I'm trying to figure out, and I would just fucking love to magically download it, like I'm in the Matrix. Eyelights. Eyelights are fun. How the fuck do I do an eye light? Because I want my eye to have a pop like I'm alive. And not like the corpsey nerd in a basement that I am. <laughs> <laughs> corpsey? Good lord. <laughs> I don't know anyone describe themselves as corpsey and all. I am. Ever, pale. I think. <laughs> um, from, from what I remember, uh, eye lights. <laughs> 
Eyelights tend to be, uh, specularity is the property of the eye. Um, oh my God, I, I know this. Less diffused. Like the less diffused a light is, the more you get that specular highlight in the eyeball itself. Because do, do, diffusing, does that, is that a term that, that makes sense? Yeah, diffusing is a generic enough science term. I got it. Cool. Yeah, so the more diffused your light is, the less you're going to get specular highlights in your eyes and the less they're going to pop because they're more evenly lit. And on a sphere like that, it's not going to look... You know, it's not going to pop. It's going to look different. I say it's not. Mm-hmm. There, there are very few things that look real bad in terms of what you're doing. It's just it's going to look different. It might not be the look that you want. So getting, um, getting, what's the opposite of diffused in lights? Very Focus? non, very non diffused lights. I don't know why that word is escaping me at the moment. I, don't know. <laughs> I need to drink more maybe. Uh, but non diffused lights will create those pops. Also, um, ring lights. If you can get a ring light and position it kind of, you know, next to the camera with the subjects looking at it, that ring will kind of, it can kind of reflect in their eyes and you get that cool little ring effect, um, if, you know, when they get close to it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really neat. Sometimes you do so, it in post too, if you're feeling finicky. I'm going to jump on that. I yeah. do not like, time to get real political here. Oh shit, hot take. The ring lights that are on a camera and so the people look like they're fucking robots. Like if it's a dead-on circular ring light and then your pupils are just white circles, mm. it drives me nuts. It is so fucking lazy and it's poorly done. <laughs> and it looks dumb. <laughs> like they clearly have the intention to use a ring light. They're well lit everywhere else and then they have those garbage eyes. It's terrible. Humans are too attracted to eyes. It drives me insane. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason the quote is window to the soul and all that. <laughs> but yes, yeah, eyes, eyes are something that we, as humans, and definitely Americans and, and largely humans, eyes are super important. Mm-hmm. And yeah, if it, if it gets blown out, which is to say too much light, that it, that it turns white and you lose data, yeah, that's not, that's not fun to look at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I want this like little anime like rectangle on the side of my eyeballs, and so I got like this <laughs> life look to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be, being alive is is a good look on camera. It is, especially for pasty ginger wannabe. What do we land on? Corpsey. 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 <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that's... Uh, what color are your eyes? Uh, green or blue, depending on the girl that answers. <laughs> nice, good. I plus, I proof. <laughs> okay, so, so you, you're, you're lucky. Your eyes are a little bit brighter. I got brown eyes. I get, I get to deal with that. Although it means I'm more sensitive to bright lights, which is really troublesome if a eye light has to be bright, because it'll give me a headache. Wait, people with green and blue eyes are more sensitive to light? Yeah, because the um, iris, yeah, the iris is brighter and therefore it reflects more light inward. Brown reflects more light outward, or absorbs it, I guess. The iris isn't transparent, though. That might not be the exact science, but that's how I understand it. Uh, I could see that. No, okay, I could see that. That if there's I'm more of your iris I exposed, probably have faulty logic. <laughs> and I. Uh... I could I could see that it makes sense if if the iris muscle itself is brighter, then it's near it's brighter nearer your uh, pupil, which is where the light actually goes in. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, I could dig that. Yeah, I just know that people are more sensitive to light if they have lighter colors, and I notice that lighter color eyes are usually more northern tribes, so like Holland or Norskis. Um, people who are Dutch, Irish, whatever, because they have mm-hmm. snow that reflects the light and therefore they have a brighter eye for some reason. I don't know. I don't know why hmm. I'm not a science... I'm not a biology guy. <laughs> I studied computers and fellow corpsey things. <laughs> nice. I, I nerded on a lot of stuff. I could tell you all about calisthenics and parkour physics, but I can't parkour. tell you about life. <laughs> <laughs> it's just applied biology at a certain point, right? Yeah. 
I have the don't die physics down. That's about it. <laughs> I mean, it's a good one to start with, at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's important to me. I mean, if, if you staying alive is going to be important to anyone, it, it being you is probably a good thing. <laughs> that's starting to take it far, because I don't know much about healthy diets or the other health stuff that's related to me living. It's Macros! Yeah. Macros, micros, calories, which, oh, uh, yeah, okay, I'm not going to get into diets and whatnot. I've been studying yeah. a bunch of that lately, and that is a cat in a bag. <laughs> we could do that another time. We're talking about eyelights and corpses and robots. <laughs> Corpsosity. Corpsosity, which is my best stat. That is, I was going to say my dump stat, but that's the opposite. <laughs> it's your munchkin stat yeah jeez but we've ranted a shit ton about lights but yeah I want to figure out eye lights that's uh, but <laughs> getting myself off my own tangent so you've got a twitch channel uh, yes twitch.tv slash practical broke I'm going to throw that in every time I think of it <laughs> oh thanks uh, were you actually Read enthusiastically and keep crowds' attention while reading lengthy exposition. And how the hell do you get that skill? Because you make it fascinating to listen to exposition. Oh, heck, well, thanks. That is like the antithesis of exposition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, info dumps are info dumps are rough in in the best of situations. Um, the the first, like, the absolute base has to be comfort with reading, like, doing a cold read. If you, if, if you have to focus too much energy on reading, like, on, 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 you know, sussing out the words and, and flowing the flow of your sentence and da, 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 then it, it's a lot more difficult. You don't have as much energy to focus on things like the performance, pacing, voices to an extent, like timing, you know, how you lean into it. It's like, like if you, for example, like uh, the, the Jarl has two teenage daughters. One of them works in the barley fields and the other one works in <laughs> I'm already the... bored. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it, it, it's, I, I was like, I almost, I almost made it exciting. I was like, whoa, like, no, 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 no. I was like, one works in the barley fields. Yeah, and so if, if as a performer you're looking at these words and you're having to think, okay, the Jarl has two, two that you, you can't, well, not you can't, it becomes much more difficult to then do things with, like you said, like pacing and, and like you'd, you would want to pace that. So I'm like, the Jarl has two teenage daughters, one of them. See, in, in suddenly you, you, it's a narrative. You want you want to be able to narrate it, and if if your sight reading is you know music term, but if if your cold reading, your sight reading is taking up that energy, you, you can't focus on performing it. The once you have that, once you kind of once your sight reading smooth, and once you're good, and once you're going, it, it vary varying the pacing and varying the volume. Those are two huge ones that so many. I mean, so many people don't do, not to be like, I'm not even like so uppity, but it's like, it's, it's a lot of things people don't consider when they're reading in public. And a lot of people, because when you read to yourself, most of the time, you read at a pretty consistent pace. Like in your head, it would be like, the Jarl has two teenage daughters, one of them works in the barley field, and the other is a, is something, 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 like that, 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 because that's, it's internal, you don't need to hear it. And so a lot of people who haven't practiced performing reading out loud, will read that way because that's how they're interpreting the text. And there's nothing like wrong with that. There's like, ah, oh, you're reading it wrong, but it's not interesting to listen to without variance. You put, put pauses to emphasize things, you know, getting a little more into like the, the nitty gritty of the technique, but just vary the pacing. Even if it's like the Jarl has two teenage daughters. One of them works in the barley fields. The other one works in the clerk's office. Like even hmm. even that, even that little bit of da, 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 into ba, 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 creates a little more interest in what you're saying. 
Yeah. That's actually really interesting because I noticed with my reading as of the last like month or two, mm. I actually noticed like consciously that I read as if I'm reading out loud, which doesn't surprise me because I always read like it's an orator reading to me and I always have done this. So my reading speed is doomed. I will never read faster <laughs> than speaking. <laughs> I read, am a slow read reader. God damn it. No, read slowly. <laughs> That's the best way to enjoy what you're reading. Galagos oh. talks to me a lot about that. Just read slowly. You know, when I was growing up, a lot was like, how fast can you read? How fast can you get through this? How fast can you do this? Mm -hmm. And you, it's, it's, it's more difficult to enjoy the material that way. It's more difficult to internalize things if, if your primary goal is... Get through it. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Um, so yeah, read slowly. Fucking revel in that, man. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, like, I internalize books and lessons and whatnot, and, God, the book on my bed right next to me is The Psychology of Money. And it's like, I read dry subjects. <laughs> <laughs> but because I read it with, like, well, I've got The Psychology of Money right next to Everybody Has a Podcast Except You. That's a fantastic book title. My material vastly changes. Oh, it's, it's a super good book. Highly recommend it, especially to people who want to have a podcast. Like, even for um, D&D &D and things like that, the lessons in it are fucking peak. Like, nice, hell yeah. It is a good book. Um, but uh, back to the point. Oh, I read dryly, but I always read it as if somebody is like in the room illustrating it to me. And for some reason, it sticks better. And it... <sighs> It improves my cold read, reading without any prep or knowing the subject beforehand. Dr dramatically. Like, if I went back and I read Harry Potter, like, I would be reading it as if the first time. I've already read it, but, like, it would be fun. It would be a storybook. And that's just, I don't know, that's the art that it feels like it was meant to be. And I'm a hopeless romantic. And <laughs> damn it, I'm not going to change for anybody. <laughs> Hell yeah. Live your truth, G. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's it. It's it's like you said, as if an order, if someone is reading it to you, if you mm -hmm. as if someone is performing it, fantastic. Like that's so cool, and that's like you said, it improves your cold read because that's how you hear it, and that's that's what you want to do. You want to you want to read it out loud as if it is being performed. You want to perform it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think a little trick that I do now that I'm consciously thinking about it is. When I glance at the sentence, I will trail my eyes two or three words ahead of where I'm reading, and my mouth will be where I'm at, like two or three words behind my eyes, and that way I can kind of get the feel of what's coming. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's an excellent technique. To anybody new, like hopefully that helps, but I think that's something I do. Yeah, that's yeah, that's absolutely a way to do it. Because uh, I, I love music and the science of music, like, oh. I wish I had a degree in composition. There's a doctorate in the college near me, and I've thought about it many times. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think of it like a song, you can see there's the first intro, it warms up, and then it has to ramp up to a higher note for the bridge of a song. Mm -hmm. And then it has the outro where it trails off and goes downward in intonation. And it's like, it's the same thing. You're in Cali. You're not just a streamer or a D&D player. In your free time. Like, yeah, like you yeah. go in that journey, and it's the same thing with cold reads. If you can figure out the length of the sentence, you can, like, preemptively get your voice doing that, and it adds the intonations going up and down, so it's not a, you're in Kelly, you're not just a streamer or a D&D player, I'm already bored. <laughs> yeah. We... Like, ugh. America, again, I, I keep saying humans, but I mean, like... Americans, because that's my experience as American culture, but largely yeah. we Americans tend to not enjoy monotonous, like mono, monotone, not monotonous like the, the, the colloquialism for boring, but things that are monotone, we tend to not enjoy them as much. We tend to not listen to them as long. Like you said, it's that da, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm bored. I'm, I'm done. I'm bored. And, and before anybody makes else. a joke about it being an internet based thing and a new phenomenon, Back when Peanuts was a comic book, like, you know, Charlie Brown. Oh, yeah. Wah, 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 wah. 
Like the teacher. Yeah. <laughs> the teacher yeah. was a joke way back when newspapers were the only media. And it's like, guess what? It's not a mm. new phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. So that, yeah, varying. I everything. think it's a human thing. I would say it's a human thing. I mean, I say that that seems to make sense. And just, I'm always careful. I, I don't want to be the one like making sweeping statements of humanity. And they're like, no, dude, absolutely not. That's, that's an American thing. Like, oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Everybody's wrong. My opinion is correct. This is America. Jesus. Do it, yay guns, um, other stuff. Yeah, let's incite things. Really, really went for it there. <laughs> I figured I would commit to the bit. Speaking of comedy tropes. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's piss everybody off. <laughs> yeah, fucking why not at this point? Uh, I mean, I, I already did my hot take of I don't like Boondock Saints too. So. <laughs> oh no. The movie nobody's seen. <laughs> it could have been so great. Anyway, that's a whole that's Could've a whole been. other ball of wax or We something. will make that a different episode. A whole yeah, right. episode. <laughs> <laughs> I will make sure to still not watch it and then we can talk about it the same way as if I did. Hell yeah. <laughs> but either way, either way. So we were talking about lighting, we were talking about mm -hmm. comedy. Uh, you did yeah. voice acting work, which I think is awesome. How active are you in voice nice. acting and how do you get into voice acting? Ah, the question of questions. Um, I'm sure you get this all the time. Oh, no, I, <laughs> I used to ask it all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, it's the question of questions. I don't get in. Um, my, like, start, start. Just apply like any other job? <laughs> well, I mean, audition sites. I went to uh, voices.com, which is a pay to play. And it, my <laughs> first thing was like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to pay to audition. But that's where a lot of the auditions are. That's where it's a big aggregator. And it's it's one of those yeah you can you can make your money back, I've I've <laughs> I've only gotten booked for one so far but I got booked for one so already that's that was pretty cool. You've done other work for people you know though, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the initial start was was the the podcast with my my buddy and we kind of started off going all right we want to do a comedy podcast and so we did research into like microphones and equipment and like what's a good one what does this look like. And then it was like, oh, like, what's this mic has a hypercardioid pickup pattern? <laughs> well, shit, I don't know oh, what that means. I need to look I, it up. I just got through the microphone section in that podcast book. I know what that <laughs> is. <laughs> I learned that the microphone I have been using as my lav for all of my actual YouTube videos uh -huh. is an omnidirectional mic, and that explains why it picks up all the weird sounds I don't want. Omnidirectional's rough. It, that it, one's. It's, it it's has great to be a if it's a lob because it's so close. Like the, it yeah. actually does a great job. I I freaking love it. It is when it's right on your neck, they work fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you're in a room with four people playing D and D and you have oh. bro who is laughing <laughs> and very loud, your audio is fucked. <laughs> he, he's on every track. <laughs> yep, he was. I could not remove him to get the person who was talking. <laughs> it's like yeah. damn it yeah, yeah you, you need you need mics that uh very specific pickup patterns and very good um i can't remember the actual term for it the noise cancellation from other directions yep mm. and that's that's wh we did all that research i mean we looked that stuff up i was lucky i was in a college class a couple college courses where i could ask my professors like hey what is this i'm trying to do this and look at that uh, and that was really neat and but, but still it was like we had to figure it out. We had to find it, and we started recording, and we listened to it, and it was like, oh, this is fine. And you know, <laughs> looking at settings, what's a compressor? What's an expander? What's a what's a knee? What's a foot? What's a gate? What's a what's a what is this fucking setting? I can't remember. The post something output boost dB. Blah, blah. There's just learning, getting all that kind of like the cold reading, getting all the technical shit down. Then you can go and perform. Then you can be like. I need, if I have to have this guy who's like, oh my God, you guys, look at me. I, I have to have someone who's quiet. I, I'm not sitting there <laughs> fiddling with shit going, why am I too quiet? Oh, I'm too loud. I'm too quiet. I'm too loud. Now you can set shit up and run with it and, and get creating and get things. And like, like many, 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 many things telling just everyone, hey, I do this. I do this if you need me. I do this if you need me. And, and making sure you don't 
oversaturate their like you're like hey i'm a voice actor like we, we get it we got it i know <laughs> it's a fifth time today you've you've accidentally mentioned that but yeah and then just just going ham because <laughs> there's also um i can't remember the name, casting casting club call is a site uh, where people for, for people doing projects um whereas voices is like companies hiring voice actors to do things casting call is is like hey i'm doing this project sometimes it's paid sometimes it's not but that is a great place to cut your teeth to be like hey what's an audition like what what is this gonna feel like what is it gonna be like when they're like hey how does this how did you read this how was it read and all of a sudden you're like oh my god i'm reading for this character and it 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 wasn't exactly what i da 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 you don't want to be doing that on a job where it potentially pays five hundred, a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, whatever. When you're going, oh, that's that was weird. I don't know. I don't know if I should send that or not. You, you don't want to be second guessing yourself for those kinds of things. So, auditioning for free stuff, auditioning for friend stuff, writing your own stuff and, and creating it and producing it is all great ways to cut your teeth, get experience. Like the experience is super important for getting into doing real work is not the right phrase. doing good work doing paying work <laughs> yeah the book itself recommended you sing a really terrible song and then record that and then just go and see if like you peak the mic or if something's wrong yeah. or like if you need to get the shit out of your background like for mm -hmm. some reason my my streamer mic picks up all of my noise from the computers like, I have one computer uh, on the ground, fans. two computers because I have a work computer. Nice. Um, the one on the ground is not touching the desk in any way. It's on books, on carpet, separate from my desk mount. And so it should not pick up any sound. It is always worrying at about 30 decibels. I don't know. It's at something terrible. You're at minus 30? I don't. I don't remember. It's okay. It's at enough to where I can't whisper easily because I have to gate it. Oh goodness, that's. I, I mean, just, it's probably it's terrible. probably your fans then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the fan noise. Yeah, I, yeah. It's like and that's always quiet. something I you have to contend with. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You, you, <laughs> your human ears are like, yeah, no, it's totally fine. And then you turn up your mic, and it's like, like what? What is there? A wind tunnel? Is there an F one track running through my goddamn room that I'm unaware of? Yeah, it's funny how the mics will pick up sounds that you don't process or don't hear. So if you do your recording, even if it's you not talking, um, turn the audio up in your ears when you have the playback going. And you'll yep. see all of the noise you're going to pick up. Stupidly helpful, but also infuriating. Yeah, yep. <laughs> and then just Google, how do I remove blank? <laughs> Yeah, oh, and that's that was the that's the whole not whole other side, but whole other facet is the technical side of recording audio of of mastering audio, not even mastering it because a lot of audio oh, went raw. But being like, oh, did you accidentally go? Like, did you did your mouth pop or something when you said something? You got to know how to take did you those touch out. Your mic, God damn! Did you? I, I moved my mouse a little too firmly. Like, uh, yeah, being aware of those and. Generally, you want a clean take. Like a, a lot of the things, a lot of like the auditions and things, you'll you'll want a whole clean take that you don't have to fuck up. But if you did a really good take, you're like, yeah, this one's it. This one's great. And you're listening mm -hmm. back, and you're like, oh, there was just one little noise. Cool. Being able to clean that up, being able to just touch that up without messing up a bunch of your audio, or like, oh, I need to retake the middle of this sentence. That could, that's another really good skill. Yeah, I'm actually super excited for um, a different guest. Like, I'm plugging my own show on my show. It feels real silly. But well, I mean, yeah. um, he's... Oh. I sent him the suggestion that I wanted him on my show. Mm -hmm. And his response was, well, what equipment do you have? And I told him my mic. And he's like, oh, cool. I've got this and this and this. Um, would we be using your equipment or mine? And I'm like, I'd love to use yours. Because I know <laughs> the guy runs his own radio station. He's a CD oh, shit. certified radio guy. Like, he is a technomancer. Like, he is the guy. And so he's <laughs> like, we can use my stuff, but I'd like to be... And I'm saying this in a shitty tone, but he was really polite about it. Um, <laughs> if we use my equipment, could you credit me as the audio engineer? 
Oh, that's, that's not, not unreasonable. He's got full mics, full soundboard, full everything. Like, he has everything. And he's like, we could use my equipment. Like, how many episodes <laughs> do you want to do with me? And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, At this rate, <laughs> a whole season. <laughs> yeah, he and I are going to be talking for fucking hours about everything. I Hell guarantee yeah. we're going to be talking about absinthe. That man and I are going to loosh. I don't, I don't know what that verb means. It's super cool. It's a French term. Blame them. <laughs> I blame the French for a lot of things. It's appropriate. We took a lot of words from them, stupid. <laughs> Germanic language. Why not take French? <laughs> Jawohl. <laughs> yeah. Omelette du fromage. <laughs> Omelette du fromage. <laughs> that was a great episode of Dexter's Lab. <laughs> I caught part of it. I remember like, this is weird as shit, because I also wasn't watching the show. I just remember no. catching that going, what the what what am I looking at? Yeah, he did sleep recording. Like, he was l trying to learn so much in his sleep. Uh -huh. And so he put on a tape of... Yeah, a tape, a cassette tape. Jeez. Uh, he put a cassette tape on of learning French. And it skipped. And it kept skipping on omelet du fromage. <laughs> a cheese omelet. And so that's all he could say when he woke up. He had no other English, no French. That was all he could say. Jeez. And that was the episode. And he was like seducing women. He was winning prizes. Because <laughs> all he would say is something in French that sounded sexy. Oh, <laughs> this is truly the peak of 90s cartoons. <laughs> 90s comedy, baby. So good. So silly. But... We've come a long way from podcasting. So, <laughs> but yeah, background noise, audio. Yeah, noise floors. We've talked about lighting. What's next? <laughs> cold reads. Cold reads, cold reads, yeah. I'm very glad we brought up cold reads. That is, on that note, it's just bothering me, so I'm going to bring it up. Yeah. Pre-made modules for D&D. &D. Okay, okay. I don't like them. I'm actually in the same boat as Gary Gygax. Go figure. Two Garys think alike. <laughs> Gygax actually didn't want to make any pre-made campaigns at all. He didn't want the idea even published. Okay, why not? The fun of D&D &D for him was making the worlds, and so he didn't want to take that away from people. But... The point that I'm getting at, my pet peeve, mm -hmm. is pre-made campaigns, like the little booklets to run a game, when people go through them and run them, I've seen so many times where they're like, oh, well, you go into this room and yada yada and you kill the monster. Okay, well, um, we're going to go out this way. Uh, okay, that's not what the module said. Uh, let me see what's that way. And they spend three hours... Going through a module that takes 20 minutes because none of it exists and they had to make up shit anyway. Because the module is a singular pre-created thing and D&D players go off the rails in every fucking direction. Yes, they do. And so, how could the module figure out what the players are going to do? They do a really good job of like creating the world and making it super interesting. Like I love the pre-made modules as far as like writing techniques and creation, they're super inspiring and they give mm -hmm. me information to work with. But I don't think I'd ever run one unless I read the whole thing ahead of time, which is so much time investment that most people aren't going to do. And then I emulated it as best I could. Like off the off fly, like without reading the book during game. Okay, like not reading out of the book directly. Yeah. I would get the baseline of what the script says and then improv. <laughs> okay, I can I can dig that. <laughs> yeah, you and I are improv specialists. We're not memorizing specialists. <laughs> oh God, right. <laughs> I, I I have an idea. I know what uh, I know. Like the, the Jarl has two daughters. Go from it. there. <laughs> yeah, it's about the spirit of it and like getting the mm -hmm. gist of what it's trying to accomplish. I can see that. I. I think it can be. I think it's a tough line to walk, mm -hmm. especially for DMs who are not 
as improv based or not as comfortable with improv or who are not as, you know, who are not as practiced at world building or don't, or they're not, they're the DMs who aren't like, I have this great idea. I have this world built all the way down to like, what color are the <laughs> eggshells in the, the chorkins? Those are like chickens, but they're different. Like, great. Like, that's cool. Build your world all the way down to the chorkins. And, but some people are like, I don't, I don't, some people don't have that much practice at that kind of creativity or don't want to like, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to build this. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And in that case, like, I think the modules are solid for for them to play the game. They're an access point for them to be able to play, which is phenomenal. Like you said, yes, yeah, there, there are absolutely pain points. When someone who's not as comfortable with improv turns around and then they go, hey, I'm going to do a, I'm going to run up the cliff and do a moonsault. Oh. Uh. Like, how do they, if they're not sure how to deal with that, yeah, that, that can absolutely be a pain point for sure. Um, like you said, going through and reading the whole thing first is, I think, going to be the best plan in terms of that because then you know what's coming. You know, oh, there's the secret door right here. And if they go out the back way, they won't find it. Or if they, like, they don't have a back door built into this castle. But if someone kicks out the wall... Then you already kind of know, oh, well, I know the castle's in the middle of this field, and so they're just going to be able to walk out under this window. Cool. Like, that requires a lot more, not a lot more, it requires a non-trivial amount of prep work. I wonder if, like, there's got to be a system. Yeah, the, my engineer brain is activating. There's got to <laughs> be a new way to make the story beats and make, like, the plot needs into its own book and say, okay... You're going to find the amulet. You're going to find some woman who lost it. She's going to say, keep it. It was my husband's or whatever. Mm -hmm. And eventually you'll find out that that amulet prevents the vampire from attacking you at night. And it's like, like have the story beats in a very simple, like one or two page document. And it's like, you have to hit these beats, put them in a barn, put them in a castle. We don't care. And it's like, maybe if I could re-engineer how the modules are done. But having sure, yeah, stat blocks... Create your, own, create your own module system. Yeah. Because that's, that's a great access point for DMs who like building and like improv, but maybe are not like the whole plot. And they're like... You know, like, like, oh, what should this amulet do? And they're like, I don't know. Like, I know, I can tell you where it was mined. I can tell you what lord had it. I can tell you, like, the the mail system that allowed it to arrive in this town. But but they're stuck on, what does it do? I don't know. It gives them plus one to fire damage. It doesn't have stats. Oh, yeah. five pages later. Sorry, it does have stats. They're yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh And so that sounds like a solid entry point for those kinds of DMs where it's like, yeah, they're right in the middle. And they're like, you're like, hey, here's this amulet. Prevents a vampire from attacking. You can be hidden here. This, it does this, it does this. And here's the lady who had it. Like, yeah, those, like you said, the story beats to, to, to reiterate what you just said. But yes. Yeah, like, <laughs> it's so weird because I know there are some people out there who get those modules and they run them perfectly fine. And it's for those people. I am not those people. <laughs> and it's like, I've seen a bunch of people not do well or panic because they're off script in the book. Yeah, that, oh, that kind of panic can set in hard and it sucks. Well, it's hard because they also just say fuck it because they're good improvers because you kind of have to be eventually as a GM. Mm -hmm. It's a and good skill. And they'll improv a scene, like you leave the barn to the left instead of the right. Oh, okay, we'll make up something here. But then that clashes with what you later deviate back into the book with. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, it turns out the barn was an illusion. I mean, yeah. shit, it, it can't have been. Uh, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it just compounds, or it feels like it does by the end of the book. Mm-hmm. It's like, hmm. It's a very interesting thing. I really... That'd be a fun thing to delve into. Given I have infinite amounts of time and magically I'm able to manage my time better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You can just, just do, what did Eminem say? You can do anything you set your mind to, man. Yeah. Eight mile. <laughs> <laughs> the music you wanted. 
<laughs> you own it. You don't miss your chance or something. I don't know. Oh, it is you own it. I'm like, what is that word? I know how to enunciate it. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> The music, you own it, you own it. It's like I always mumbled it properly, so I didn't <laughs> learn the English phrase. <laughs> uh, here on a D and D podcast, you learn about Eminem's great lyrics. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty. He's, he's he's real good. He's real good. I liked his old stuff. I I haven't found a new song that I like. Not that they're out there. I've just given up after a lot of the poop songs. That's fair. He had he had a weird stint for years <laughs> as uh, as artists do sometimes yeah so yeah i'll have to look up what 38k hertz as well as 32-bit float mean we were talking about that i think before recording yeah before we actually um, went live yeah how hertz, all that audio stuff works hertz is a frequency it's how often wait no wait no hold on before i say something yeah talk on my ass, hertz is frequency of waves no it's one of them is how often it samples, how like how often it pulls a sample from the actual sound wave. That's it's been a long time since I've actually looked into the physics of this. Um, I can't remember. I'm not. I'm not going to stand pat on that because I don't exactly remember specifically what it is. But I'm a bard. I'm okay being wrong. I'm going to yeah. say Hertz is frequency of the sound waves. And if I'm wrong, I'll look it up after the episode, call myself an idiot, and sleep well. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So, back to my pre-made questions. Yes. What were your biggest influences when you were young? How's that for a cold read? <laughs> That's good. That was solid. That was good. But anyways, what were your biggest influences when you were younger? You said you were a band kid, but what actually inspired... Like your art, were there any like video games, any TV shows, any people that stand out? Like who put your uh, moral structure in view? Right, good, good lord. Okay, oh my god, <laughs> hold on, I need, I need a drink for this <laughs> shit. Um, now, one of my first DM, my first DM actually ever was a buddy of mine in high school. Um, he was super smart, and he was he was really into it. So I got really lucky that the first time I ever played D and D with this guy was. That someone who knew the system inside and out, and who has having a lot having a lot of fun with it, and he got a copy of or an issue of Knights of the Dinner Table, which was a comic. Now I think it's a web comic. It's, it's hilarious fun. I love it. Uh, signed by Gary Gygax. Oh, cool. Uh, he, my buddy, went on to become um, a PhD student. Eventually, get his doctorate, and now he's super smart doing super smart research. So that's always kind of neat. When I was like, oh, "Hey, I used to I used to play D and D with that guy," <laughs> and him him providing this thing, this like it was so he built he I mean he built D and D to be fun. He, it was immersive. He was into the story and the characters, and for me, that was the perfect entry point. Where I some people prefer to play D and D focused on the numbers and that's totally fine I, I never want to say that anyone's playing it wrong as long as everyone's having a good time but i got lucky in that i really enjoyed the characters and the immersion and the immersion and the world building and this dm was really into that and i was like wow this is this is a ton of fun i really like this and so <laughs> it kind of spoiled me i've only had really honestly i've only ever really had good dms i, I think i'm really lucky in that yeah that was lucky um or if it's been one of them, like, ah, hey, cool. This is this is like a one-off. I'm not having a great time. We'll see you guys next time. Don't call me. Um, <laughs> that, that was a big one, getting me into like D and D proper. Mm -hmm. um, and lots of video games growing up. Lots of big story video games. I loved the idea of just these big worlds. I loved, honestly, one of my one of my things that I still really enjoy is a really fucking good town. I love a good town in a video game like give me some examples uh fable the albion the world the world of albion i can't uh like bowerston in fable like these towns that feel like they're alive that you can walk through and that there are this that society is interacting there are people doing things there's this row of houses like it's right next to the i don't know the fucking swordsmith and they've you know this the second son of the third house like always wanted to be a swordsman and like and it's it's these these worlds that these things that feel like this is a world that you've stepped into and that you can experience 
versus just being like, oh, hey, yeah, town, you can rest and you can get weapons. That like that's not for me. I like I I liked Legend of Dragoon for that. I never played that one. That's fair. It was obscure and it's it's very solid in its villages and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And in the contrast, you could say Legend of Zelda, like the old ones, like Link's Awakening. Mm-hmm. It's like those villages were real flat. <laughs> and it's it's rough. A lot of the you know they had to deal with the technology they had at the time. So it's mm-hmm. it's it's difficult when you. You know, on the N64, your textures had to be painted into your polygons, basically. So you couldn't have a cool stone building. You had a, you had a JPEG on the front of the building that had pictures of stonework on it, which is it's just rough. It's it's really rough to build an immersive uh, um, um, environment with with those technological limitations. And I, I totally dig that. Let's jump back to that. Yeah. DOS games were also good, like DOS, like the old Windows DOS, the pixels don't even halfway exist. But we're, liking, we're talking like Commander Keen? Yeah, like Commander Keen, we're talking Space Quest 1. <laughs> <laughs> even on to your example of like Fable and some of the other ones, they, they did it with one character, like tons of tiny one-liner characters. Mm-hmm. But their one line told you about their character and their story. There was no, like, wasted space. And so yes. like, you can, like, learn from that and just copy those lines if you even wanted to and put them in your D&D game. I've done that with shit. Yeah. Like, uh, the game I just ran the other day, there was uh, basically a Vegas strip. It's in the mm-hmm. capital city. They're doing stupid shit. And they're like, okay, we want to hustle some people. We're going to play chess. And so they play chess and they start getting mad at each other and faking that they're like betting on stuff. And then they start arm wrestling and uh, they just went off the rails. And they were doing stupid shit. Hell yeah. <laughs> they were so goofy and they fooled no one that the people thought it was a comedy sketch. <laughs> and the players didn't catch it. Until they realized people are putting money in our wager pool that we're betting each other to earn each other's money. Like (laughs) Their fake betting pool was getting enlarged because people thought it was a tip area. Oh my god, that's fantastic. And it's like, the people didn't say any words. They just did that. And it, like little moments like that, Mm -hmm. where there's like assumed understandings and like blank canvases... They just allow characters to breathe life into a game. Yeah. It, they, it does heavy lifting, to, to, yeah. to take a phrase from writing. Yeah. Because if they're that, in a Vegas strip, they're going to be looking for entertainment. That's what kind of informed that decision for me. Mm-hmm. Nice. That's hella cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they laugh their asses off. They're like, okay, we're going to try this again. I'm like, don't. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. you got lucky once kids <laughs> you, you weren't good they were pity coins <laughs> it's so funny I made the really characters cool. do a uh, uh, perception check or charisma check or something to mm-hmm. realize that people thought they were a comedy troupe and only one of the three of them passed so oh my like, god <laughs> so he hammed it up and the other two legit thought they were still hustling oh that's fucking phenomenal (laughs) i love those moments it was so silly but yeah those little lines um Mm -hmm. keep telling me about those villages like was it just villages with a lot of life to them or what else informed like what you wanted to find in interactions and games and things like that well as far as the villages go it it in addition to feeling alive and in the interactions like with with elements of the game, I also really liked towns feeling like these safe havens between dangerous areas. I think Skyrim, when Skyrim first came out, I felt like it did that really, really well. Like you, you know, you come out of the, you come out of the cave and you're following the guide. To, I can't remember the name of the first town now. Um, uh, but, White Run. White Run, yeah. R- and it yeah, was like White Run and River or something. There was one, at one point I was traveling to another town and I was going through like snow and mountains and th- this really hostile feeling terrain. And I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have, I don't, I don't remember if I was using fast travel. I can't, I can't remember if Skyrim has it. 
like from the middle of nowhere. But it was it does I, once you get to a place, so not right away. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm like running around, like I'm trying to find this mountain. I'm in this this you know snowy again a nice a very nice visual environment. Skyrim's still gorgeous after what it's been like 15 years, but like even on launch. It was amazing and gorgeous. And so I'm walking through this like hostile, inhospitable terrain. I don't, you know, I'm far away from the other town. I'm crunching through snow and like I'm fighting like were werewolves. Yeah, I think I ran into werewolf at one point. But I'm fighting all these things. And it's it it feels like a trial. It feels like I'm going through this. And I finally made it to just this little town, this little spit of a town, and I don't remember which one it was, but like I as a player. I felt such relief to be getting into this tavern, even though it was just a little shitty like log cabin tavern thing with a torch and like <laughs> some guy playing loot in the corner. And I was like, I'm fucking like, I'm, I'm safe. I've arrived at this safe haven where I can relax after going through this fucking wilderness expanse of, in you know, where survival isn't guaranteed, at least as far as my experience was concerned. And it, it it they had paced it so well and they had paced the distance between the towns that 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 little town felt really welcoming and felt really safe versus yeah. the like oh hey i'm i'm just going to teleport over to the next next town cool again that has its place absolutely but also that that experience of getting into a town for the first time after being in a dangerous area where survival isn't guaranteed really has this like immersion to it like, I found those little taverns and whatnot cozy, because they had, like, the yeah. fire in the middle, which mm -hmm. was for cooking. It was very practical. Mm -hmm. But also, around it, there was usually, like, a bard and, like, a couple people listening to the random guy singing some song about whatever propaganda he liked. Yeah. And it's like, it was very real. And they were rough mm -hmm. songs, but it was a single guy singing, so it made, like, perfect sense. Yeah, that kind of life that's that's one of the really great things i like and that's one of the things that kind of inspired me with like you know storytelling and dming is trying to make these places that feel alive that feel safe that because mm -hmm. when you go out and you're fighting yeah there's always in in tabletop games there's largely the assumption that your players are safe if they don't make real dumb decisions <laughs> and and that's that's Again, that's fine. Nobody wants to join a, a, a tabletop session and on the second week be like, ah, oh, man, sorry, unlucky rolls. Your character's dead. We'll call you in three months <laughs> when we start a new one. Like, yeah. oh, shit, that sucks. No, nobody wants that. Um, and so playing within that expectation of, yeah, your, character, your, your PCs are not going to just die. So how do we play with this? How do we make it feel dangerous? How do we make it feel like your survival isn't guaranteed? Or how do we raise the stakes to make these places that you then get to feel safe and welcoming and like, oh my God, we made it. Like we were out in the wilderness, we were <laughs> alone. When you're not, so you're not just going like, oh yeah, cool, we'll just, we walk to the next town. Uh, cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's not what I would be about at that point, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to doing that to my players. Um, in the, <laughs> this, this will probably come out after that game runs, but we'll see. <laughs> Either way, if they know it's coming, it just adds to dramatic irony. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gotta love it. So, <laughs> they are going to be doing a return trip. I made them travel all the way out to the capital city. Um, they know every town. They know every stopping point between here and there. Because the wilderness is very dangerous, especially at night. Um, I actually took it from Castlevania 2, Simon Belmont. Ooh, um, nice. Or Belmont's Quest. Or Belmont's mm -hmm. Quest? Either way. Um, the It's a terrible night to have a curse. It's a horrible night. I always mess that one up. Yeah, I can't. But at night, all of the animals, all the monsters, are all turned into monsters. Like, the monsters become super bad, mm -hmm. and the animals turn into, like, transformed, horrible monstrosities. And so the towns have to illuminate the cities that way they can't come in yada 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 but hell yeah i am planning to have their cart break down in a ghost city because there is one town on their journey that they passed through and decided not to sleep in that was intelligent 
the town is a ghost town because the farms on the outside got destroyed. They don't know this yet, but they'll learn about it. The farmland got destroyed. It couldn't sustain itself, so everyone moved away. That's like a very real reason for a ghost town. And so in this harsh world, it'd be hard to get enough people to re-inhabit, yada yada. It just stayed a ghost town. Mm -hmm. There's some terrible shit in it. I'm going to break their cart's wheel. They're going to be fucked for a night. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> but yeah, it's like they have the means to get to safe havens every day. The travel isn't that bad, monsters once in a while. But yeah, it's like I will make them enter scenarios that raise the tension. Yeah, that tension's important. It's so important. That's why I love horror so much. Um, it's a slight horror game. It was supposed to be a dark horror, specifically. Mm -hmm. But the characters are too charming and whatnot, and they keep doing <laughs> silly shit. So it's like, okay, it's it's mild horror. <laughs> hey, it's spooky. It's like dim horror instead of dark horror. <laughs> it's like, okay. Gray horror. <laughs> yeah. But that's okay. It's still... I didn't have the chops in me to run another full, full horror game. Um, the Black Sun was my last one, and that was beautiful. I loved it. Went well. It ended. It concluded properly. But uh, I don't have enough in the tanks to pull that kind of horror again. That takes some doing. Yeah, that's, that's when I learned that... The games you run are you working through stuff. Like, usually if you're pulling from a source, it is catharsis. That's a big one. That's absolutely a big one. Yeah. And so Black Sun for me was me dealing with a lot of dark shit. And now that it was, like, when it concluded, I was like, okay, that story is written. That is done. I've dealt with it. It's out and i still don't fully comprehend it but that's the emotions that happened and yes. so something i had is gone and healthier i don't get what it is <laughs> <laughs> hey any improvement's a good improvement progress yeah. <laughs> as much as i love horror it's like i just haven't had a burning darkness to pull from which yeah, it is what it is. I'll just run fun fantasy games. <laughs> <laughs> right? Hey, yeah, if you can, uh, <laughs> like, I if can, you run can those channel forever. that. <laughs> it's interesting. So you've been a player your whole life, despite this podcast name, right? Or have you run games? I've been both. I've run games. Okay. I don't think you're a forever GM. Nah. Nah. I, 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 I enjoy playing, and I enjoy, like you know, running someone else's game, and I'm totally down for that. Um, mm. But yeah, no, I'm not forever GM in that I don't ever... I, I luckily do not have a dearth of GM friends. I usually have <laughs> someone who's willing to run something. Yeah. That is something that I've found is, after studying, like, video games and whatnot and movies, like, I've gotten to a point in my storytelling skill set where it's hard to take a step so far back and let newer people run games for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like a professor having their student try to teach them a lesson. It's like... It's like, no, eh. just... No, just... No, listen. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I want to help you do better. <laughs> because I'm better? Is that wrong to say? <laughs> uh, it's... It's hard. Yeah? Because I'll see, like, errors in pacing. I'll see where... Three of the four players are bored as shit. Like, I'll see yeah. right through, like, their plot and, like, this and that. And, like, oh, he just fudged those numbers. And I know it because of his mannerisms. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a curse to be the Forever GM. That was almost the name of the podcast, The Curse of the Forever GM. <laughs> it is the journey, not the curse. <laughs> I, I like Journey. I, Journey's a little more approachable. I think I think that was a solid choice. <laughs> yeah, I like Journey because it's more about the stories and the adventure, and like there's a lot to becoming a forever GM. Like life isn't so straightforward, and like we were talking about, like mm -hmm. with streaming and like film school and whatnot, like the lighting, 
the lighting informs people and mm -hmm. one of my favorite things about it is I will try to envision the scenario like I'm a film director and then I will have to remember the players can't see my monitor. Yeah. Like the thing that I'm seeing my movie through. And so I have to, with words, deliver everything that's important in my scene. And so I'll be like, okay, as the director, I know that I need to illustrate that there's a bush to the left because there's somebody hiding in it. There's the house in the background. There's a woman screaming like this and that. Like what happens in what order? How would this play out as a movie? Yeah. But I have to verbalize backwards what the script directions are. <laughs> yeah. And it's so interesting because I'm literally writing the script directions, improv, in the moment, two, three people who have to react and act in the scene. And it's like there's so many cross skills between yeah. all these medias and mediums. I love this shit. This is why I'm a GM. <laughs> it's it's so awesome. It's such a crazy puzzle. <laughs> yep. And it's it's freaking awesome. So, last prepared question I got for you is what were your biggest lessons that you see new people struggling to grasp? My one of the one of the ones that sticks with me. This is for um for DMing actually because I think this is this is clutch. <laughs> New DMs and DMs with new players, because that's also kind of a new thing. New players will say, what can I do? And they'll have their character sheet and they'll have like the, the things that the DM has told them. They're, you're in a tavern and there's a lantern and there's a guy and there's a sword and there's a jar. Cool. And then and a, new player will, will, a new player will often say, what can I do? Because they want to work within the rules of the system usually because they're still learning it and i mm -hmm. think it's important for dms to instead instead of telling them oh well you can attack you can charge you can bluff you can pick this up you new gm dms gms whatever should say what what do you want to do what does your character want to do what do you want to happen and then the dm is the one who interprets that request in the spirit of the rules. Mm -hmm. If like, and so like, and again, it's not, it's not like horrible. It's like, it's a lesson. It's a lesson to be like, this is how you make these games so much more fun for people, for your players, instead of them saying, okay, well, I've got my long sword and I can attack this bandit. I can attack or move or use this skill. Yeah. I can use this skill and, and like, cool. Like that, that, that's, it's, it feels too reductionist to be really really fun mm -hmm. especially for people who are getting into the system or people who are not super hardcore role players or people who are not looking to run really hard numbers like that's totally fine if you want to run hard numbers great great play that way but if you're brand ass new or you're really new or you're just getting into the game and the idea of role playing in D&D &D, the DM should be going what do you want to do what, what would your character do like Oh, my barbarian, I, I want to punch this guy in the face. Cool. The, then the DM goes, awesome. That's going to be an attack roll. You need to roll that die. Okay, awesome. Versus trying to give the player go, versus the DM going to the player, do you want to make an attack roll? What does that fucking mean? Sorry, I'm swearing. What, like, <laughs> what, what, what does that mean? Do you want to make an attack roll? What, what, do I use my strength? No, no, no. You use your, <laughs> use your Thacko. No, like, <laughs> yeah, a reference yeah. no one will get. Oh, you're, you're all welcome. Go Google that, kids. No, it, like, because as soon as the player's in this mindset of, I'm following these rules to use this, they, they get lost. And it's not as fun. It's more difficult to have fun being this character. I'm Throganar the Barbarian. What, is, what would you do? You'd fucking punch this guy. Or you'd, you'd grab him by the throat. Okay, cool. Then the DM ideally, would know, okay, that's, maybe it's like a grapple check. Maybe it's an attack roll. Play it however, like, the, the, it's, like it's like the DM is there to interpret the rules for the players to be these characters, to, in, to embody the barbarian. Or, he's, you know, <laughs> he's, he's the character that no one's ever done. He's the shadowy, he wants to be a shadowy figure in the back of the bar. And it's like, oh, this guy walks in, he's like, I want to I wanna, I wanna eavesdrop on their conversation. 
great. Then the DM goes, cool, roll like this, this skill, roll a D20 and add that number to it because this is how, this is how you're going to do it. This is how you're going to, how your character is going to use their skill in order to get this information versus trying to be like, oh, do you want to use your eavesdropping skill? Nope. Then we've, we're separated so far out. Then we're just looking at words on paper and it's like, we're not playing our characters. We're just going, oh yeah, I guess, I guess I'll use that skill. Great, I got a 17. What, that, doesn't, that doesn't fucking mean anything. That's not, you can't embody that. You can't dive into your character with that, like, with that separation. So, yeah, yeah the biggest lesson is like, ask your players, what do you want to do? And then you as the DM interpret those rules. And then for players, be like, can I do this? I want to do this. This is what my character would do. Avoiding, there's a whole other toxicity of my, it's what my character would do, but that's, that's dumb. I don't know about that. <laughs> that will you, be several episodes. <laughs> yeah. what, what would Thrognar the Barbarian do? Would he punch this guy? Would he stand up and hit him with a chair? Would he tell him, go away, Lowlander? Like, do that. D do what your character would do, and then the DM interprets those rules for you. Yeah. I think pulling back to what we said earlier, the... DM's job is to be the computer in Baldur's Gate and the player can say, I want to do something and they go off script and the human who's being the computer can adapt because they're not a computer. Yeah, it's like that's exactly. the GM's yeah. job. Mm -hmm. Although yep. if you're a new GM, don't expect to know the rules. That's fine. That's no, tough. None of us oh, do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, new GMing is tough because someone's going to go, Hey, can I do this? And you're like, I have no fucking idea. I don't, I don't have a clue. <laughs> I don't... Maybe. Yeah, like, so my tip for new people who are running games who don't know what the hell they're doing. First of all, welcome. That was where I started. Go ahead <laughs> and write down anything people ask you that you don't understand. Like, oh, I want to go attack the wall. Okay, attack wall. What the hell does this mean? Yeah, what is that? Okay, does it, write it does down. the wall have hit points? Does the... <laughs> but in the meantime, ask them to roll a die. And if it's a d20, which it should be, 20-sided die, if it's over 15, give it to them. If it's 10 and above, mm -hmm. and it's their specialty, let them do it. If it's below that, tell them, you tried, but it didn't quite work. Problem solved. You don't mm -hmm. have to know any rules. <laughs> <laughs> those are my shortcuts for anything including npcs i make up in three seconds and have to role play with and that suddenly become the party's favorite yep and they're not supposed to be in the scene and suddenly it's like oh this is the guy that kept dying over and over it's like he was supposed <laughs> to be the assassin and now he's the clown <laughs> that's this is it's the that's that meme of how D&D &D parties start off and it's like the wall at Helm's Deep and now they end up and it's Monty Python. Yep. <laughs> Never goes as expected. <laughs> yeah, so I am trying to end these with a challenge from the previous person I interview. So, the person before this, I won't tell you who it is. <gasps> sneaky. Sneaky, sneaky. They gave a challenge of make a monster that can't be killed, but still make it fun. And then you'll leave a challenge for the next guy. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm Come surprised on. he picked a D&D &D one because we hardly talked about D&D. &D. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a monster that can't be killed, but is still fun. I think it's some kind of like tentacly thing, but that like every time you, you, cause you can still damage it. So you can still fight it. You can damage it. You can like maybe chop off its tentacles. Maybe it's got limbs. Tentacle, tentacles are a bit rough. Tentacles are a bit, are a bit, they get lost and there's <laughs> stick my associate with them. Maybe this thing is like, it's like a, like a human looking spider thing. It's just got a ton of limbs and you can damage it. Every time you chop off a limb, it gets slower and stronger. Like whatever magic it's animating the limbs, if you chop one off, it doesn't remove the magic, it just, whatever, you know, it, it gets rid of the protoplasm that was the limb was made out of, and the same amount of magic remains in this spider thing. So it's slower, because it has fewer limbs, and it, it like, maybe they're heavier, 
and but it hits harder because this magic is still animating it. So you have to like, if you're trying to get past it, you have to cut off enough limbs that it's either, it's like grounded. It's, it's like a spider with no legs. It'll regenerate the limbs eventually. And you know, you can't, cause you know, if you try to stab it in the center, it's not gonna do anything. It's gonna slide through it cause it's like animated magic plasm stuff. But you know, for, if it starts off with maybe like three or four attacks that do like D4 damage, you know, depending on your level, or whatever. They just pop, 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 little slappy attacks that don't do much. And then you, as you damage it more and more, it gets fewer attacks and those attacks hit harder. So you have to change your strategy with how you're approaching this thing. So there we go. I like it. I would have just been cheeky and said like a ghost that tells jokes, but. <laughs> I, I thought about comedy and I was like, nah, I want, I want to go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's the easy button. No, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. That's that's really creative. Hey, thanks. <laughs> but yeah, it was definitely a pleasure to have you on here. Um, the time went surprisingly quick. Yeah. So I'm sad to see it go. Ah, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it was <laughs> it was a, it was a blast to be on here and getting to talk about my, my life and lessons. Yeah. Now that we wrestled with the time zones. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good lord. Cool. Well, I will say goodbye. I don't have an outro. Goodbye to the world. May all your 20s be natural, and may all your scheduling be easy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>